Um, about three o'clock in the morning, I decided I'm going to go off script. This is the last talk for the day, and you guys are all been working hard uh, watching these uh, talks. So um, I thought maybe I'd just uh, be a little bit more casual about uh, the delivery. This is our uh, legalization of uh, fake news. So. Uh, there's a, a Welsh comedian, uh, Alan Davies, who has a TV show uh, in uh, the UK. It's called uh, "Yet uh, As Yet Untitled, and that's what I started out with here. The premise of the show is that he has four guests arrive, they're all comedians, and he talks to them for about an hour, and after the hour, when they're there, um, he decides what the title of, of the show is going to be based on the conversation. When I started working on this talk, I, I had a hard time trying to figure out what the uh, title was going to be, and I got really fixated on that, And because um, I, I figured the title is critical uh, of a talk, and because uh, it's the thesis of what the presenter's going to come across with, and then he has 45 minutes to, to prove his thesis, right? And it depends on you know, the crowd and whether they accept it or not. Um, the title is also The Walk Away, and that's, that's the tricky part for me here, is the walk away uh, of what the talk is about. So um, I, I just couldn't figure out what the best, the best thing is for this. Uh, so I, I played around with a bunch of different things. The first title I came up with was Going Native. I thought this was the ideal uh, title to come up with. It was, you know, came right off my head. I even created a graphic for it. I figured it was all set. But then I started feeling pains of political incorrectness, right? Because you know, going native was this colonial term, you know, basically degrading people who uh, started behaving like the the the, uh, the cultures that they were uh, of these countries that they were taking over. Um, and then I found out that it was also used by somebody else in a past talk, so I figured I might as well just throw that out. So I, I got kind of desperate, and I sort of asked other people to come up with a title, and and Alex saved me. He came through with, uh, why, do you, why do you just say uh, you want to do a talk on a native script engine? And I said, okay, that's pretty good. I'll just do that, and that's what you see in the program. So let's, let's go with that. And it's, you know, it's precise and basically says what, we're, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, then I had this panic attack in the middle of the night, and I said, oh, this is not going to work. I've got to have something, something a little bit uh, more powerful, and that's where I... This, this whole idea is, is the, is the JVM, you know, is the, is the Java purism and NIH killing the JVM? And I said, oh, that will be a real, you know, catcher, but, you know, really that's just clickbait, right? So it's just something that uh, you would click on and then realize that, well, what a, that's a stupid story to, uh, to be reading, so. Um, then I got into this uh, whole business of, uh, is the JVM being hobbled, uh, hobbling your, uh, your development, you know? Um, is, is the JVM really a square peg uh, in your development process? And why is method splitting even a thing? So, you know, anybody who does bytecode generation, it's, it's ridiculous, you know. Anyway, I just thought, uh, okay, I'm ranting. I better slow down here. Um, then we get, uh, then the next title hit me, it said off the shelf. You know, and of course, these days off the shelf means uh, something is so good that I'm going to take it home with me. I'm going to buy it and take it off the shelf. Um, but of course, we, most of us realize that off the shelf means that you use something that's already out there. You know, there's, there's a lot of software out there that's had hundreds, if not thousands of years of uh, person development on it, um, and you should be using it. In this case, I came up with the analogy of that you've been slaving on the stove all afternoon, uh, coming up with the most fabulous pasta uh, sauce that you know ever invented, even though you can look up in the corner there and you can see the can and you can reach down and grab the can and save you a lot of time. And then through all the process that you've been uh, going through, your family got hungry and ordered a pizza behind your back and then uh, you know, you're stuck there with a the sauce that nobody's gonna use and maybe you should have uh, grabbed the can and used it. Finally, when I was talking to John about this talk, he, he suggested that uh, you know, you should talk about Panama and, and push for the idea that, uh, you know, Panama is going to help us uh, move forward, help the JVM move forward. And I think that was fair, and, uh, I, you know, 
I'll, I'd, uh, uh, I'd try that one. Anyway, I still don't have a title. Um, but then again, maybe the title doesn't really matter. So maybe other factors take control of, uh, of how the talk works. Maybe I should have used Helvetica thought font. Maybe I should have more graphics. Maybe I should ask Brian to do the talk for me. It would have been a lot easier. And McLuhan uh, was probably right. You know, I'm just overthinking this thing and I shouldn't even worry about it, so. Uh, I pointed out, by the way, that McLuhan was Canadian because, uh, you know, we're all philosophers and we're not all about beer and hockey sticks, so. Uh, at any rate, uh, unlike uh, David's show, um, I have an idea where this conversation is going to go, and, uh, but I don't have any control over how you're going to think about it after, after it's all uh, done. Uh, let's just see what, what happens as we go along. So I had uh, a decision to make. Uh, where do we go next? NASA Hornet has been in development uh, for seven years. Uh, it's been out with uh, JDK 8 uh, for the last three years. It's gained a lot of traction. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that use JavaScript if they don't use NAS Warren. So as people discover that uh, JavaScript is available in the JVM, they start using it. The three main areas that people use NAS Warren are isomorphic development, where they basically have a shared code base on the, your client and your server, and the, the code base can move back and forth. It's an ideal scenario where you, you only have to hire one type of programmer. You don't have to hire both types of programmers uh, in your shop. It's also used for soft coding, where the code may change in the fly. So for instance, uh, uh, stored procedures and databases, configuration management of your, uh, of your uh, application, uh, anything, anything that requires you know, uh, change without having to rebuild your environment. And people are using it for shell scripting. You know, I know several people that are actually built a whole business up uh, based on shell scripting uh, using NASWARN. Unfortunately, we, uh, we've never been able to have more than two to four uh, engineers working on this project. And uh, that makes it tough, because it really does take a village to pr uh, prepare a programming language uh, for delivery. We have this huge backlog of things that we need to do. Uh, we didn't, I didn't, when I designed it, introduce an interpreter because I didn't think it was going to be that crucial. Stupid me. Um, so we go straight to bytecode from the ST. And so it takes a while for NAS1 to, to warm up. Uh, we're finding that we had customers that were submitting bugs complaining that uh, NAS1 was about five times slower uh, executing their, applica their applications and finding out their applications were basically just feeding one line scripts and they were taking so much longer, where the uh, Rhino interpreter, opt minus one, could you know, basically do it just like that, because uh, it didn't have to go to bytecode. It was basically just uh, interpreting straight up. People were saying that their, our benchmarks were significantly slower than other native JavaScripts. Well, we're not native. We're basically implemented on, on the VM. Um, in general, though, People were kind of happy with Nashorn just the way it is because ultimately it was really all about um, connecting up with Java. They wanted to be able to work in JavaScript, but they wanted to be able to exploit their Java environment. And that's really what it was about. But then I always was getting all these messages from, from users that yeah, we really want to use JavaScript on the JVM, but we want it to be as fast as V8. Then we have this other problem where they, obviously they changed the spec. So we have this ES6 spec, and basically trying to get this all implemented, and some of it's being delivered with uh, JDK9. And then there's J ES7 and ES8 in the works. We didn't have any support for Node.js. No uh, that the project was tried. It was an avatar JS project to try to get Node going. Uh, just wasn't, uh, wasn't flying, and it's been put on ice somewhere. And of course, the other JavaScripts were getting better and better and better. There's V8, there's Nitro. The spider monkey. So let's face it, you know, in the world of JavaScript, V8 rules. They have a fast startup, a fast computation, small footprint. If you use V8 from your application, you find that the, you'll find that the API is really easy to use. 
You can plug it into almost any C application, C++ application. It's really to use. It embeds well in a hostile environments. It's got to sit in a browser. And the browser couldn't be any worse or a worse environment for anything to run in. It tracks the ECMAScript standards. It basically leads the ECMAScript standards most of the time. And of course, Node.js is everywhere. Everybody's talking about Node.js. So what if we were to make a sibling to NAS Horan that used the V8 engine? We matched the NAS Horan APIs, and you can see the NAS Horan APIs everywhere, even in, even in the Truffle, uh, Truffle code, Truffle JS code. Uh, this would minimize the porting from NAS Horan to this new thing. We keep the, the APIs really high level, so people are using the same APIs that they were using in uh, NAS Horan. Um, and uh, keep the full dynamic access to Java. There is another product out there called uh, J2V8. It was done by Ian Ball. Um, they did a similar sort of thing, but, but Ian was mostly focused on the embedded market. So he kept all his APIs really low level. Um, using a, it's a static API, it's not a dynamic API. Uh, and you have to do things like your own GC. You have to manually dis, uh, release uh, objects as you're using it. So let's do a proof of concept. And let's try to integrate V8 into the JVM. So we started this proof of concept uh, the end of last year. I, it was just me. I just uh, started it on my own uh, originally. Uh, and the whole idea was to implement V8 engine as a, a jar and a native library. We'd focus on the Java X script API initially. And we'll worry about the Java callbacks later. We'll just, this is a proof of concept. So you should be able to do, you know, create a new engine of type V8. Okay. Then the next step would be to measure the, the stability running on the JVM. Does it, does it interfere with memory and usage in the JVM? Does it interfere with signals? You know, how does it handle null, uh, null pointers? Didn't seem to be an issue. And of course, if you think about it, the V8 has to run, into, run in a browser, and there couldn't be anything worse than a browser to run in. Next step was to measure performance. I, I didn't get hung up on how I was going to do performance because uh, it was just, you know, uh, just needed to know if it was going to be faster than NASWAR for the most part. I did see significant improvement in speed. I saw, saw better memory usage. And uh, it was, seemed to be better than Rhino, NASWAR, and, and GraalJS. Uh, the opt one minus one is straight interpreter. Up uh, nine is the, the most optimal uh, um, uh, version of Rhino. J and I didn't seem to be a, no, a problem. I was really concerned about that. And but as we get further in the talk, we'll talk about uh, Panama a little bit uh, because most of the scripts, the use cases that we were seeing from our users uh, and ourselves, were that JavaScript was being used as in and out. Evaluate the script and take the result. There wasn't a lot of callbacks to, to Java. And if there were callbacks to Java, they were fairly sparse. They weren't something like I'm pounding on uh, something on the Java side to get it, you know, like every cycle. It was infrequent. So this, this use case seemed to uh, be pretty good. There's bulk data issues, but there's workarounds to that. We basically have no copy uh, byte buffers uh, to uh, V8 array buffer, and it seems to work fine. Um, as I said, I don't want to get into grand details about the performance, but these are sort of, sort of the things that I did. I just basically just did a straight time thing. Uh, so the times were basically from launch to exit. Uh, memory was basically against the null main. Uh, small scripts, we had this, there are wor this worst case scenario uh, uh, application where there was about 17,000 lines of script fed to the engine one line at a time. And um, against uh, the inter uh, Rhino interpreter, which was the fastest at the time, it was three times smaller and three times faster. Well, when you're seeing NX instead of percentage uh, improvements, you know you're on the right track. That's where you want to be. Um, micro benchmarks, for instance, you know, like the uh, Octane splay is an example, balancing a large tree. It, it uh, used half as much memory and was six times faster. And that's from start to finish, so that all the warm-up issues of, NAS, of NASHORN and GraalJS are, are tied in there. Startup time, 
uh, is twice as fast starting up as Rhino and about 30% faster than, than uh, NASA and Girl JS. So this was all very encouraging. So let's go beyond uh, uh, proof of concept and onto an experimental version. So that's, I brought in uh, Sundar and Hannes to, from the NASA team teams to help me out with the rest of this. So working with uh, JVM V8, just to get you a sense of what you, how things work uh, in the JavaScript world with, uh, with Java, this is the standard example of how to get an engine. So you get a V8 engine, you can get uh, context and bindings from that engine, you can set the bindings, you evaluate, you get the result after the execution. It's all pretty straightforward. Key here is V8 is the engine we're using. On the JavaScript side, this is where the, the NASHORN APIs kick in. The, the java.type is how you get a, a specified type. In this case, you want to get the Java util array list and, and uh, basically copy that to a local variable. And you notice the const is there. That's the ES6. You can use the old style Rhino form. That works, uh, works as well, if, if that's the way you want to work. And then once you have that type, you can create new instances of it. Uh, you can call methods against it. You can access fields. Um, it just works, okay? Beyond NASHORN, uh, if you've used NASHORN, there's a, the ability to create shell scripts, and you can actually use backticks to indicate uh, that you want something fed off to the system as a system command. Um, in ES6, they've used backticks to represent template strings, which are multi-line strings where you can actually embed dollar sign bracket or brace uh, uh, expressions in it. Um, so we needed some kind of translation for that. And uh, in ES6, you have the ability to have uh, these template strings with a tag in front of them. So often the tag would be JSON tag or HTML tag or XML tag to indicate that you want that string to be pre-processed uh, before it's passed off to Java. In this case, I just used underscore as an example. Uh, we want the string fed to the exec command, or the exec uh, primitive. This is a NASORN primitive. So I can actually feed execution off to the system with the backticks. And then we got one step further in ES6, JavaScript has introduced classes. And if you wanted to override a class in NASORN, in, in the old style, you had to use a special extend uh, declaration. Uh, you had to use a special syntax to over indicate overridden methods. In this form, we can use the ES6 classes. And we can indicate that we're actually overriding a Java class. And we can override the constructor. And we can call the super. Wow, we've got bonus. Running of a V8 engine is pretty straightforward. As I say, the API is easy. Uh, you, we have this correspondence between a, a script engine and the V8 isolate. You create a V8 isolate. That's the instance of the engine. Uh, it's self-contained. It has its own memories, all of its uh, 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 performance data. All the objects that are created in that instance are all defined there. You create an instance of the uh, isolate. You can create a global in that isolate. And uh, if you use JavaScript, you know you have a global variable that all have all of your global functions and uh, properties sitting in. So we populate it with uh, all the NASHORN functionality. And uh, if we want to be able to access Java, java.type or java.2 or any of the NASHORN uh, APIs, we run a script written in JavaScript that populates the global with all of that information. Evaluation, straightforward. Again, you just take the text string, the, the script that you want to execute, feed it to the context, you know, compile it. You can save the, con uh, save the compile in an unbound uh, script. You can feed that uh, compile script to a context for evaluation. And once the script is evaluated, we take the results. And in Java terms, we have to figure out whether we just uh, pass it back as a primitive value or wrap it as a POJO. 
So the components uh, for this scheme uh, it would be the jar and the uh, native library marked in red. So the user to app talks to the JVM. The JVM looks for the, uh, for the engine uh, through the resource lookup. It finds it in the jar. The jar uh, initializes the library, and that library connects up with, uh, connects up with V8, the V8 engine. The things that are contained in the jar are uh, JavaX support. So we have full JavaX support. All the, all the APIs are there. Uh, we have a V8 native class, which uh, is used to handle all the V8 down calls. So all the implementation of the native stuff is through that V8 object. It also handles all the callbacks from V8 uh, coming back up. It, it includes all the wrappers for all of the uh, V8 objects that are coming back to the environment. And these are all uh, of uh, JS object types, so that anybody who uses JavaScript and Java together from Rhino days up to, uh, to Nashorn days, the JS object is the way you communicate with a JavaScript object from Java. We do a bridge DC uh, to manage all the V8 objects, so we do automatic garbage collection of all the V8 objects. Don't have to worry about it. No manual operations involved. We have a constructor for generating POJO wrappers. So if we have a V8 object that shows up, uh, and uh, sorry, a, a Java object that shows up in, in, in the JavaScript, we kind of create a wrapper for it. And then what we do is we call back to say, okay, we need a, a wrapper for this, and then we generate the JavaScript to create the wrapper. And then uh, finally, this boot uh, script that we run if we want to provide Java, Java support. The native library includes all the implementations of uh, the V8 native, cla uh, native class. All the data conversions, uh, for instance, the string, uh, Java length string to V8 string and back again. That's all there. The bridge GC for managing uh, Java objects on the JavaScript side. So if uh, JavaScript is finished with the J POJO object, then it lets Java know and it gets released. So it's all automatic. You don't have to worry about the objects. All the native uh, uh, V8 primitives written in C++ are all sitting there. And then all the key JNI methods that we need to call from the uh, V8 side, or the JavaScript side, uh, they're also all implemented in this library through, uh, there'll be a, uh, a, uh, a property that you'll see here in a minute. It's the V8 uh, JVM property. So finer details. So the V8 objects in Java, uh, we take a V8 reference, which is a 64-bit address, uh, we convert it to a long, and we wrap it into a Java equivalent. So there's a JS, uh, sorry, a V8 object on the Java side, and inside of it would be this long that references the, the uh, Java, uh, Java object. We have specific ones for the specific type on the JavaScript side, so there's a V8 object, there's a uh, V8 array, there's a V8 proxy, and so on. There's whole slew of them there. Each of these implement JS objects. As I mentioned before, this gives you the ability to manipulate these objects on the Java side. This is all stuff that's been around since the dawn of Rhino. And it also implements maps. So you can treat a JavaScript object as though it was a map. So if you want to access a property, you can just index into the property and get the value and work with it. V8 objects, uh, sorry, JavaScript object, Java objects on the V8 side we take the global reference and pack it into uh, a V8 uh, external. These are really lightweight uh, values. They only take uh, up 64 bits. Um, and then there's a, an equivalent uh, JavaScript class that contains, uh, would store that uh, external. So that would be the Java object, it would be a Java class, it could be Java list, it could be some kind of functional interface, one of those sorts of things. And then the constructor maps to, uh, to say, a Java class. Constructors uh, for the JavaScript objects are generated by the Java code. So the wrappers around these objects make the uh, POJO on the JavaScript side look like Java objects, so I can call a method against the list. So really easy to use. The wrappers also look like JavaScript objects. So we looked at the, uh, the class representation there earlier on the JavaScript side. Uh, so I can actually say list instance of uh, array list. So I can actually do, treat it as though 
it, you know, very naturally, whether it's an array list, and that's basically all handled in JavaScript. Uh, the JavaScript generator, uh, it's rather complex, the sorts of things that it generates, but this is the constructor for array list. Um, uh, just looking further down in the example there, you see the count arguments equals length. This is basically how many arguments am I passing to the constructor uh, for uh, when I say new array list. If the count is zero, basically not passing any arguments to the constructor, then I call off and create a new instance of that uh, object. From the Java class, we have the Java class information. Um, that's the method ID and hexadecimal values. Uh, JavaScript doesn't support long, so you have to break it up into two 32-bit values. And then you wrap it. So this is the sort of thing that the uh, constructor generator would, would use, or produce. The JNI primitives, and this is the, sort of the crux of you know, how this all ties in with Panama. Uh, in order to communicate with the, with the JVM, we're using JNI calls. Um, and the JNI calls are basically the, our optimization boundary. We can't optimize beyond, you know, beyond the JNI, like the same way as Hotspot would. And this is, this is why you might not want to use uh, this tool in some circumstances, depending on the types of things, because the fact that you're gonna be paying the JNI over it. It's the optimization barrier, but that doesn't mean that we can't optimize up to that call, and so we do some, uh, play some tricks in JavaScript uh, to help us you know, get the most optimal code we possibly can. So as an example, uh, let's say if we were calling JVM uh, get array element, which is a JNI call, and the second argument is supposed to be an integer, if I, if I sla uh, modulus zero, that tells JavaScript that that's gonna be an integer value, and then it optimizes all the way back up to say, oh, this is gonna be an integer value, and uh, produces optimal code for that. So this makes the marshalling of arguments to all these JNI calls very efficient and uh, easy to do. We're not currently using Dynalink, uh, be, probably, uh, properties uh, in V8 are already handled, so we already know what method we're gonna call because the property lookup is already at the, at the call site that we're, we're making from. Uh, but we wanted to make some consistent choices uh, uh, for uh, um, argument overloaded methods. Uh, we wanna be consistent with NASWARN. So we took some of that code out of Dynalink to be able to find the, the right uh, method we wanna match up. The boot, uh, boot script, which is used to uh, introduce uh, uh, Java support within the environment, uh, is all entirely written in JavaScript. It uses the, the, the JNI uh, primitive interface, the JVM dot, and then the JNI call, uh, to communicate, communicate back to the JVM. It's pre-compiled and uh, stored as a bound script. So if you create a new isolate, uh, we can basically run the script fairly quickly. We don't have to recompile every time. So bringing up a new isolate is, uh, is very quick. This uh, boot script has all the code that uh, manages um, all the activity from the Java, Java perspective. So it handles all the Java classes, objects, arrays, um, all, all on the JavaScript side. It's all managed there. There was no point writing any of this in C++ because the thing is that Ultimately, the same, uh, same sort of code generation is gonna take place uh, because V8 is an optimizing compiler. Uh, so we, 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 we wrote it all in JavaScript and paid a little penalty for the startup, but it doesn't seem to be a, a big issue. Uh, if you wanna get rid of that, you can just say you don't want Java and everything will be just as fast as you would expect with V8. This script is also used to implement uh, all the NASWARN extensions. So if any of the extensions like, like you know, java.type, java.2, java.from, whatever, uh, those are all implemented in this boot script. So it makes it really easy to manage uh, and uh, update and add new functionality as, as you go along. So here's a simple example. This is the implementation of java.type. The uh, support routine is uh, java under type. And what it does is takes the name that you're passing in and do a lookup and see if it's in the local map. If it's in the local map, then it just returns that, that value. Uh, if it's not, then it goes off and uh, finds out what the, what the Java class is, make a JNI call to find out what the Java class is and construct a wrapper for it and, and store it in the map and then return the result. Uh, and then the, the second part of this uh, uh, in the, in the uh, function here is uh, to, um, uh, actually, it's defined it as a global. 
so that person, a person using it can say java.type and uh, it will actually go off and do, and do this code for, for you. Okay, so some of the more interesting bits of uh, how this was all thrown together. Let's talk about garbage collection on the Java side. The Java objects, uh, JavaScript objects uh, in V8, we're, we're pinning them in uh, V8 persistence. These are, are basically static uh, field variables that we can, we can define, define them in uh, actually large pools. Um, and then we stuff the, the, the value in that persistent and then pass the address of the persistent back to, to Java. So that's where the, the uh, uh, long reference, V8 reference, it comes from. We're using, we're using I'm, I'm supposed to say, Java Lang Ref Cleaner, but we're actually using Sun Misc Cleaner um, to uh, manage the cleanup of these objects. So when, when the wrapper that contains this reference disappears on the Java side, the cleaner is, calls, does a callback and says, I'm done with this object. Let V8 know I'm done with it, and then it gets released. Collection on the other side is a very similar sort of thing. We, we uh, store the global ref in, a, in uh, a v, V8 external. We store the external in a persistent, but this, this is a different kind of persistent. We basically flag this one as weak. So the, the POJO sits in this external, you know, on the JavaScript side, and when it's not referenced anymore, the callback gets ca uh, called, and we say, okay, let's get rid of this global ref. We don't need it anymore. So we, we have a balanced garbage collection. Don't have to worry about the garbage collection. Um, because we set it up using the Java uh, NASWAR and APIs, uh, it, it was possible to um, deport a lot of stuff over from NASWAR without making any changes. So for instance, the primitive uh, dollar sign exec, which is the one used to, to make system level calls, uh, just port it over mostly as is. We didn't have to make that many changes to it. We, the adapter bytecode generator that we use to create subclasses of, uh, you know, subclasses of Java objects in the JavaScript side, that, that code was pretty much ported as is. It was very little change that we had to make. Portions, we used portions of the um, uh, Beans linker from Dynalink, as I mentioned earlier, and that was to re help resolve uh, method calls. And then a lot of the NASWARN samples just ported over very nicely and just worked. Didn't have to worry about it. All the exception handling, uh, all the I.O. that's being done, it all goes through Java. It just, just all works. One of the big things that we pushed for, uh, on NASWARN was the fact that we could do multi-threading in NASWARN. And then we always say, oh, it can do multi-threading, and uh, you know, we can do multi-threading, so that's you know, a bonus for us. Um, but we, we needed to come up with a different story because the way threads are handled in the V8 world are very different uh, than uh, they're handled in the Java world. So um, in order to use an isolate, you always have to lock it. So you take an isolate, you lock it, then you can use it to your heart's content, and when you're done with it, you unlock it. So that's not very Java-like or, you know, not any, nobody should be using that kind of mechanism, but it makes their VM very fast, so you don't have to, to worry about all of these things. So. Um, so this means that only one thread at a time can use an isolate. You can have thread A use that isolate and then release it, and then thread B can use it. There's no problem there, but only one at a time. But because these isolates are fairly lightweight, you can have literally thousands of them, uh, you know, they, they basically just add, uh, allocated what minimal amount of memory that they need to execute in. Um, if you think about, you know, you're sitting in your browser and you're opening multiple tabs, you know, and there's a separate isolate there for every one of those tabs, then, you know, you, you can have quite a few of them. So in our, our circumstance, what we did, we set it up so that you were free to pass an object across an isolate. Okay, so if you created an object in one isolate, then you could pass it to another isolate. If it, if it goes back to the same isolate, we just unwrap it and it becomes its original JavaScript object. But if it goes to another isolate, uh, we treat it as a POJO. It's a, it's, a, it's a JS object. So it just behaves naturally in the other environment, except you have to go through the wrapper. So it allows you to pass objects across these isolates. So this is how we build up our, our, our multi-threaded story. So in NASR and our multi-threading, we, we, we use this, uh, the load with global, um, uh, uh, function. 
which basically allowed you to pass values through to the other side and it would create a new instance that you could run on a separate thread. Unfortunately, V8 isolates required a managed thread, so we had to come up with a different scheme uh, for doing this. This, this is one of the few things that we had to, to uh, change up uh, working from NASWARM to V8. Uh, so we created these uh, th things called fork and fork with an executor. So fork uh, basically would create a new thread and then create a new instance to run on that thread. Pa you can pass arguments through that side and then away it would go. So you can basically have two, you know, one, one instance of JavaScript starting another instance of JavaScript and they would start executing. This, the, the result of uh, creating one of these uh, or running one, one of these functions is that it produces a future and with the future you can then get the value from the future uh, whenever you want, want to pick up the value. We'll likely port this back to NASHORN so that you know, people can use it on the other side. So here's an example of multi-threading. Um, calling the fork function, feeding it a lambda function. Uh, want to print the threads, uh, current thread. You want to print all the arguments. You want to do a stack crawl. Uh, you want to return done. Then the arguments we want to pass to that fork. Um, and then you get, when you get the future, uh, then you'll get the result come back. So then these are the values that you return. Then there's that node thing. It's out there. Well, we've done all this work. How much further is it to get to node? Well, this thing works with node as well. So there, what we've done is we've created a JVM v8 uh, node uh, module, which is effectively an alias through to uh, the JVM uh, library, v8 library. We have to put it somewhere where Node can find it easily, so we, we, we store it in this directory. Then everything else is the same API as we were using, uh, just in normal JavaScript, with some exceptions. Uh, if you use Node, you're used to using console.log. Well, you use console.log instead of print. But everything else is Node, right? So this is how the, the Node configuration looks. Uh, you have a node app, it communicates with node, it goes through to uh, the, the VM, JVM no, a, V8 node uh, sort of alias uh, to get to the library, and then from there we communicate to, to the JVM and then also to the jar. It's also possible in node to get a new instance of an isolate or a new engine. So you, you could actually launch another engine if you wanted to, but that's not the way node works. People don't, I wouldn't recommend that because no, no people would uh, turn their noses up at Everything has to be quick, quick turnaround. So uh, in order to prove that this was all useful uh, in the real world, uh, I took the, the, uh, the Node.js chat demo, which is a standard, uh, standard gem demo, and following the machine learning theme, I, I took the Apache uh, OpenNLP, which is the natural language processing libraries. It's all written in Java, right? And then also 2Prolog, which is an uh, inference engine that's written in uh, uh, Java to, to analyze the input. And I ended up with a chatbot. So I could actually communicate back and forth with this chatbot. Um, you know, how, yeah, I'm doing well. I'm glad to hear about it, so. In order to use uh, uh, JVM v8, uh, you need to create a new instance of the JVM. Uh, so first of all, you require the JVM. Uh, then you do a create and then pass in uh, whatever arguments you want for creating the VM. JVM, in this case, we really don't care about the class path, so we would just want to supply the class path uh, to the JVM. Once you have that into the JVM, Java, then you can just, just use it the way you have in the uh, other circumstances. I can say java.type, the class name, um, and then create a new instance of, let's say in this case, prologue. Um, and I can add theories, create new instance of theories, add that to the, uh, to the uh, prologue engine. So there's some uh, prologue code sitting there, sort of similar to what I used to actually use in this case. And then solve it, get prologue to actually solve that. So, so what did I get from this? Uh, I, got a sustainable JavaScript for JVM. As I mentioned earlier, I only had you know, two to four engineers to work with. Um, NASA took about 
20 person years to do. It only took about a year, person year, to do this work. I ended up with about 26,000 lines of code compared to 180,000 lines of NAS horn. Um, so what do I have to do to maintain it? Well, if V8 updates, well, maybe I might have to change some of the APIs, but it's going to be a lot less work to maintain in a long, long time. So in, in dollars and cents, you know, like I say, if it, the cost to a company, a typical programmer, is three, $300,000. When NASA was $600 or $6 million, you can see, you know, where this all makes sense in your case. Experiments we have in progress. Uh, we've talking, been talking about using Panama for down calls, uh, so we don't go through JNI, we do down call through, uh, through Panama. Uh, we can use WebAssembly for up calls. WebAssembly is uh, ideal for uh, marshalling arguments and do, doing the correct data types, uh, strong typing. Um, we have security in place, we have sandbox security, the same as NAS, NAS Horn, if you have the security manager activated, it just works. We also implemented the class filter, so you can filter all what classes that you feed in. You can also do a no Java, uh, and that will not give you any access to Java at all, if you just, all you want to do is execute scripts. We've got debugging working, using the, the Chrome Dev tools. We can understand why JavaScript programmers are so in love with JavaScript, because the Chrome Dev tools are great. You can, you can do all your standard debugging, you can do performance analysis. Uh, it, they're, they're really great tools. And they just work. We got them for free, basically. Well, a little bit of work. We have server governance. So uh, some of the projects that uh, are, are used here um, uh, want to be able to control the execution. So we can control the execution of these threads. We can basically say, oh, this thread's run too long. Kill it. We can do that. Or it's used up too much memory. Kill it. We can do that. So for, in the server environment, we can set it up. Um, and of course, everything is cloud these days, so we, we did a little test and, and uh, to, to find out you know, what our min minimal image would be. It's around 60, 60 meg. We haven't done a lot of tuning, so we might be able to do something about that. Uh, if you do a lean, uh, create a lean uh, Node.js, that's about 44 meg. So we're in the ballpark. And the big difference here is that, well, you've got a lot more Java there than Node.js has minimally. So where to next? Well. I, Amazingly, this is all pretty stable. Um, I started up that Node example, and it just sat there for weeks, and I didn't even look at it. You know, and then any time I did look at it, it was still chugging along, and the memory wasn't but climbing or anything. It was just still working. So it, it seems to be very stable. Uh, there's some projects uh, internal to Oracle that are, are currently using this uh, package. Uh, and our next step is to try to figure out um, what uh, um, we need to do to put it out in the open. Our current thoughts are actually to put it into uh, uh, to Oracle GitHub. Um, seems to be an ideal place uh, for it. Uh, we're currently only supporting Linux and uh, Mac OS uh, 10. Um, the only reason we haven't done Windows or, or uh, uh, Android or any of those is because we just haven't had enough bodies to uh, create the make files or whatever necessary to make that happen. So we have to figure this all out in balance. So let's, let's call this Go Panama, because I think that's probably the next step, is to figure out how we, um, how we, we fit this in with uh, the Panama environment uh, to get good performance through the JNI calls. Um, and I got to use my graphic. So thank you. Uh, I guess that's really the plan, ultimately. Um, it's not something that's going to happen right away. Um, I, I, see, I think Nashorn's life is at least another year and a half to two years or so. And it may never die, because the thing is that, you know, unless we deal with the JNI issues, then what's, what's, the, you know, what's the difference? And that by that time, you know, Grawl, JS may have stepped up, right? So, so you know... We're going, to, we're going to continue to put effort in, into to NAS Horn. We're going to continue to introduce the ES6 uh, features that aren't implemented in uh, JDK 9. Uh, and as I say, we're not really sure where this is going as far as public use is concerned or general use is concerned. Uh, so that, that's sort of an undecided question.
question long term. Whether it actually ships with JD, JDK, that's a whole other big story because the fact is that obviously binaries are involved and we don't ship binaries with the JD, you know, uh, stored binaries in the, in the JDK repository. So it gets complicated from that sense. So there's a lot of other factors that have to be figured out. So. I know you said a few things about performance. How would you, in the final analysis, compare uh, performance? Well, that's what, so we're not really there yet. But the thing is that we haven't introduced anything that would take away from that performance. The only thing that you know really is this this uh, Java support script that has to run, and you know it, it's just a few milliseconds to run in order to to, to to populate it. I can't remember how many lines of code it is. It's oh, actually, I do. I had a slide there that showed you how many JavaScript lines on it. So it's it's uh, it's it's hefty, but it's not enough to really slow it down significantly. So, If you're just doing straight JavaScript, it's basically back to where we were talking before. It's pretty fast. So, Okay, that's it. Oh, yes. So how do you support all the Are you going to support all the platforms that Java runs on, like Spark? No, probably not, unless, unless you know, there's unless there's a demand for it, right? So it's, it's a case of, of um, we're trying to introduce a migration path for NASWR, ultimately what we're trying to do. And the need for performance is now, right? People are, people are demanding performance now. So this basically provides that performance now. The long-term strategy is yet to be worked out. I, I, I'm not really hearing you that much, Jeremy. Maybe, Jeremy. maybe I shouldn't say that. I, 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 I withdraw it. I'm not going <laughs> to. Yeah. 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 So V8 runs, V8 runs on a lot of platforms. Yeah. We, we can do the work, and we, and we may, but it will be probably on, on a need basis as opposed to we're just going to do it for everything. Right? So our current need is primarily Linux right now. Right? So. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Thank you.